I feel very lucky to have my job in many ways. And there are a lot of great things about working in academia. It's a special kind of place to work. Um, and that, but that, that element of like passion and you're lucky to be here is also what allows us to be exploited, which I think is also very common in the games industry too. Hello and welcome to One Cool Thing, a podcast from indie game studio De Good Fabrique, hosted by me, Hannah Nicklin. One Cool Thing, as you may have heard in other intros, is a podcast speaking with people in and around video games about one cool thing not from games, which is really fascinating them right now. So we'll get to know them and their practice through talking about the one cool thing that they've brought to the conversation, and then finish by considering how it's shaping how they think about how they make video games. It's hopefully a chance to hear more about the practices of cool people working in games, and also space for us to all reflect on how we think about how we make things. So, without further ado, we're going to introduce our next guest. I should say I got quite excited in this recording. I might talk a little bit more than I have done in the other ones. So I hope that you all feel like you get enough of the guest, um, as well as me having uh, thoughts too. I hope you enjoy it. And without further ado, here we go. I'm excited to welcome Mike Cook, a British game designer and artificial intelligence researcher who's currently a senior lecturer at King's College London. I originally came across Mike via uh, the fact that he's advocating in general within the sort of wider games community, but also within the AI research community to demand better ethics and responsibility in the development of the technology. Um, he's a member of the Knives and Paintbrushes Research Collective, for example, which is uh, one of the places that I, I discovered him. And his personal practice is interested in the spaces between AI and game design. He's also a founder of Proc Jam, a procedural generation game jam, um, and wrote a book on Twitter bots. And well, he's doing a lot of things because when you're a researcher, you have to evidence what they call impact, which basically means get yourself really, really tired and stay in that state for a really long time. Uh, at least that was my experience of academia when I was in it very briefly. Um, so Mike, welcome. How do you feel about the intro? Anything you want to dispute, amend or add? <laughs> Uh, hey, Hannah. Um, no, I think it's a lovely intro. I think uh, I liked the uh, the bit at the end about doing a bit of everything. It does feel like that sometimes. Um, it's always funny to have you be introduced and have things listed off. Um, but yeah, it's lovely to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Really, really delighted. And actually, this is probably the first time that we've, we've spoken, right? I think it is, weirdly. I, I feel like people like yourself, I feel like I've known for a very long time because I've seen so many of the things that you've done and we've moved in the same circles, but I don't think we've ever sat down and had a conversation, so I'm really looking forward to today. So, um, as you know, the sort of theme of the podcast is one cool thing, so I wonder if you could tell our wonderful listeners um, what your one cool thing is. Yeah, my one cool thing is being on strike, um, which uh, is what's going on right now for me. Cars hooting, chanting into megaphones, picket lines of public sector workers standing out in the cold in puffer jackets. Scenes like this have become all too familiar in London in recent months, but particularly today on what is being dubbed Walkout Wednesday, Britain's biggest day of strike action in over a decade. Today I'm here at LSE in a picket line that's been receiving rather less attention than some in recent months that of lecturers and university staff, 70,000 of whom are striking today. Hooray, yes. I mean, I suppose the situation, not cool, which is for the reason of <laughs> being on strike, right? Right, exactly, yeah. There's cool cool things uh, um, growing out of something uncool, which um, is very much how the whole thing's affected me, I think, really. Yeah. Awesome. So let's get sort of started digging into this. So um, I guess you're a member of the UCU, right? Yeah, that's um, the, the union that represents most university lecturers um, and other groups like teachers as well um, in the UK. Yeah, U university and colleges union. That's the one. When did you join the UCU? I joined in 2020, so uh, when I moved back to the UK. Um, so I'd been in Germany for a while um, and watching a lot of things happen in, at a distance. Um, and when I came back, I started teaching. And that was the point at which I realized like now I was in a position to kind of be a part of that and, and do something. Um, and so I, I joined up. Um, and even at that point, I think the UCU, this this action that we're a part of right now kind of started 2018, 2017, I think. So it's been going on for a while. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, w I was reading up on on the current dispute and it, it does, the, it sort of cites the academic year 2017 to 18 as the beginning of the dispute. Um, so it's been going on, as you say, for a super long time. 
Some congratulations are in order, though. Uh, Joe Grady, uh, what's Joe's like uh, technical like role? Is she the the chair? general? The general? Yeah, I, I forget the the title. The general secretary, maybe. General, the general secretary. Chair? Okay, the, so yeah. Joe Grady is basically the person yeah. who sort of leads the union. Um, announced or was it like five days ago now that um some planned strikes for February and March are being put on hold, not cancelled. Put on hold because you made some really big you, you got some really big wins and, and you sort of continue negotiations right yeah so funnily enough you you and i had arranged uh, today's recording in advance today was due to be a strike day um but today's uh, strike got called off um th it was put on pause as you say the, the action as a whole hasn't been stopped but some days were were taken off the rotor um due to what they said was uh, they wanted some some kind of space for focused negotiations um and one thing that's been really interesting is you know when i i it was quite scary to join the union because i didn't really know what i was doing and I, and it felt like i wasn't a serious enough person or i didn't know enough to to be a part of this thing and and even now lots of things happen where i'm kind of surprised oh that's how this works like so so when the ucu announced this um it was there was a bit of a divided response you know some people were very excited by it some people were, were quite angry about it um and so it hasn't exactly been smooth sailing um, but the UCU are, are feeling very happy, certainly, um, and they're balloting us right now to see if we can get a new, uh, what's called a mandate for strike action, so kind of permission to strike, as it were, um, because laws in the country are quite strict. Um, and while that's going on, hopefully there's going to be some uh, some serious negotiations, and then we'll see what kind of offer comes out the other end. And I know that I, I've brought you here to sort of talk about how a, a core thing is, is influencing your practice. And we'll definitely get to that bit, but I just think we should really air some of the things that, like the reason the strike has been ongoing for such a long time is very much to do with how broken the university and well, in, in general teaching has become in the UK, right? Because of a number of, um, I guess, like under the influence of, of the American system and in general, the behavior not just of the Tory government or coalitions that have been in, in power for over a decade now but also a lot of the the way that um new labor also um approached turning universities and education in general into a business right um they have started behaving like businesses with profit a as opposed to you know process and education at their heart and there there have been some just you know, I know that the UCU is is campaigning on many things, work life balance, equality, pay gaps, but one of the and pay in general in the context of the UK going through a you know terrible cost of living crisis um, with inflation topping ten percent. Um, so even if you get a pay rise of five percent, you're getting a real terms pay cut. Uh, in the context of that, there is a really big problem with casualization, um, involuntary zero hours contracts which for those outside of uh, the UK, a zero hours contract in the UK is something whereby it's in, you complete, you're completely disempowered as, as a, an employee. You're given a contract which says that they can tell you how much you're working uh, this week and they can give you no hours and they don't have to pay you any money if they give you no hours or they can give you like far more hours than you can handle. And in the context of that, they can also punish you. So my, my brother was on a zero hours contract for um, like the first uh, 10, 10 years of, of his um, time because he graduated directly into the financial crisis, got a zero hours contract job. They used to punish him if he took time off sick. They would give him no hours the next week if he took some time off because he was unwell. And that... <laughs> it, it is, and it's and it's legal. <laughs> um, so and and you know, not only are universities massively overworking their staff, but um, a lot of the people who keep the university running in administration, in cleaning, in you know, lots of different parts, are forced onto zero hours contracts, and um, you know, therefore massively underempowered in the workplace. Yeah, it's a it's a hugely exploitative environment. Allowing universities to triple what they charge students for their education accelerated the drive towards, you know, becoming a business and taking on too many students. And once you have too many students, you don't have enough people to teach them. So that increases the workload. And then you need 
to you know labor has to come from somewhere to teach them so that's either people working for little money as you say or people already working doing extra time for free and it all gets linked together in a, in a horrible web um and there's also an element which i think it shares with the games industry which i'm obviously also closely linked to because of my research um which is that there are a lot of people who you know I feel very lucky to have my job in many ways. And there are a lot of great things about working in academia. It's a special kind of place to work. Um, and that, but that, that element of like passion and you're lucky to be here is also what allows us to be exploited, which I think is also very common in the games industry too. Some of these problems, they, they feel almost insurmountable. And I think that's what puts a lot of people off do, joining a union or, or something like that, because it feels like, well, you know, can anything really be shifted? Um, but it was a really moving experience for me to join a union for the first time and, and go to a picket line as a union member and, and feel what that was like. Um, and it definitely was like inspiring and gave me a lot of hope. Mm, the soundtrack to this uh, episode in my head is Billy Bragg's There's Power in a Union. It's just sort of <laughs> looping in. I'm sure in one of these picket lines, you've had someone bring their guitar and, and start start singing yes. There's Power in the Union. So maybe I'll maybe I'll link that in the liner notes for everyone to enjoy. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and, and just like a, a final sort of reflection is I don't know if um, so. I, I kind of don't want to bring my, <laughs> my my parents have this thing where they say, well, you know, if 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 because I've always done, I've been in theater and then I've been in video games and they're sort of incomprehensible like career paths to to them because they worked in the public sector. Um, they had careers for life with really clear kind of structures and stuff. And um, they they very often say to me, oh, well, you know, if, if video games doesn't work out, Hannah, and they're very supportive, they don't want it to not work out, but they're like, you've got your PhD, so you can always go back to academia. And it's really hard to communicate that actually, I, I don't think academia is a more secure place anymore. It's not a place where you're treated better for better pay. Like, I'm not saying that video games is better, um, but I'm saying that the same struggles of, um, you know, uh, exploiting workers, of working for free, of crunch are just as evident in academia now as they are in video games. Um, so, yeah, I just, I'm agreeing with you. There. Um, so you mentioned your, your sort of, first time on a picket line there I, I wonder if if you could talk to us a little bit about that moment and how you felt just before going and what it felt like to arrive so it, you know I I have had left-wing politics for a long time now um and uh I think I've been really fortunate to meet certain people in my life who were able to teach me things and open my eyes to things that I thought that that I couldn't do or that would be too scary um one person in particular that I met on a random research project who I, we still don't really know why we were both there um, was Jamie Woodcock, who's a sociologist and a labor organizer um, and many, many other things. Great author. Um, he wrote a book called Marx at the Arcade, um, which is about video games and Marxism. Um, and he opened my eyes to so much of this stuff that when it when it when it was when it came time to kind of join a union and I, I realized that I could meaningfully do something. Um, joining a union was like one thing that was very easy but yeah like that first day of traveling in and not really knowing what i was even going to say when i got there i felt kind of like a an idiot in some ways and um and i felt like you know i didn't have enough political education or i wasn't going to be able to say the right things and then you get there and everyone was just like smiles and care and it was um it was such a, a friendly experience. Um, it was also really interesting because at the time, so I worked at Queen Mary uh, when I joined the UCU. Queen Mary had a very, very bad time um, fighting uh, against their management. Um, and actually the student union didn't vote to support us uh, in the first year that we were that I was on strike there. Um, and uh, that was always difficult. And so when we were kind of handing out pamphlets and stuff that many of the students were supporting us but the student body as a whole you know wasn't doing the kind of things that they would have done if if, if they voted in, uh, in in support um and so as you're handing out pamphlets you realize like you know some people are not okay with this some people are kind of interested in it and your colleagues are all different as well some of them are quite passive some of them are like really aggro and energized some of them obviously don't turn up for various reasons because they can't or or you know they're they're not they're not interested in that day 
but overall it was just really exciting to be surrounded by other people who cared about these issues and i think especially you know i work in a computer science department and there just aren't a lot of people in the union there um the political makeup of departments varies a lot um and computer science does tend to be one of those departments without a lot of union membership and so suddenly seeing all of these people who wanted to make changes about these things was really exciting um and the the union members from computing at Queen Mary were also really welcoming and supportive of me um so yeah i i, I don't know it was just it was such a, a, a an unexpected sense of community um and a lot of energy of like feeling physically doing something just just felt amazing mm. and you just noting that um the the lack of support from the student union there i think one of the you know effects of commercializing education has positioned uh, students as consumers right mm, uh, and there's yeah. a lot of sense of like what value you're getting from your education and you know i'm paying so much now that i i expect so much in return and withdrawing teaching hours um instead of being seen as something which is being done you know with education at its heart um is being seen as like the withdrawal of a service they paid for right so that's one of the divide and conquer things that the raising of tuition fees enabled in 2010 which has meant that in some universities yeah it's been harder to sort of secure the support of um of students um do you have the support of, of students in your in uh, your current university Yes, um, and I believe so. So King's King Student Union voted in favour, I believe, and I believe Queen Mary's has this year as well, which is um, fantastic. It was a very narrow vote, in fairness, and it's important that the students do this to navigate their own understanding as well, of course. Um, but like you say, it, it it is so easy to manipulate, and Queen Mary were Queen Mary's management were were quite good at, at manipulating it. So I did my undergraduate and my PhD at Imperial College, um, and that had no humanities department. Um, so you didn't have any politics students, you didn't have any art students. Um, and it was a nightmare. I mean, I didn't like it. You know, I, I wanted to be a journalist at the time. It was a really weird experience. So being on the picket line at Queen Mary was also like one of the first times I'd met a politics student, which sounds wild, but it's true. Um, and what it made me realize is that the attitudes that different departments have also shapes student expectations. So the politics students all understood what was going on. They Most of them like loved it they all understood. And that was partly because 90% of the politics department were on strike. But then you look at a different department where maybe only three or four people are on strike, and people don't even understand what is happening or, or why the you know, this one lecturer is not doing this thing. Um, and so I think it's, you know, it is possible to fight back against that kind of divide and conquer, as you say, but it's it's really hard. And you see how different students come at it with a different kind of perspective as a result. And, and it also depends on kind of what they're going to university for and what they're hoping to get out of it. Of course. And I think that, that maybe perhaps for people outside of the UK, it's worth just noting that the underlying mechanisms of class pervade our society um, to, down to the level of like the kind of university you go to. Um, there used to be a system which divided academic universities from universities designed to get you trained and in um like normally into a profession um and we we called those polytechnics um w w out of which came some of the most exciting thinkers of like the 50s and the 60s right um it was sort of revolutionized by the open university. But, I mean, how far do you go back? People took tests at the age of 11, which put them into the clever school or the school that didn't end up sending people to university, right? And then you've got the divide between universities and polytechnics. And then the open university was actually kind of what Americans, I suppose, would call like correspondence course university. Um, my parents in particular benefited from that. Um, no one had been to university before, but when they were both in the mid like you know their late 20s they both did open university degrees and they suddenly had a degree and you did it you know through the post and you went to summer schools where you um you studied more um and that really like changed the access to a degree in the country and sort of i think as part of the the fall of the divide between polytechnics and um, universities as they were known but that stuff is still part of the foundations of our universities so when you had the universities beginning to decide that when the cap was lifted on tuition fees and universities were deciding how much they could charge like the big two oxford and cambridge were obviously charging the most 
And then you had these previously polytechnics, which are seen as less good still, which weren't able to charge as much. And it, yeah, it begins to get, uh, yeah, you know, classes is right there. So you might get more working class kids going to previous polytechnics and all that kind of thing. And then, I don't know, my undergrad um, university was um, Loughborough University, which is is quite high up in those those rankings. Uh, and as you said, what people study is relevant as well, because that was largely an engineering university and sports university. And it was overwhelmingly male. Uh, this, I think I, I did a drama degree there. Um, and um, I think they were thinking of, getting rid of it and my department argued that they would have no women on campus <laughs> it's a very sexist argument but they were very happy to make it because obviously their jobs are on the line and I mean at that point they were like the fourth or fifth best drama degree in the country and how they were assessed um so yeah just just lots and lots of kind of class upon class upon class things that means that you might go to university and they're full of um, people who are probably quite rich already, who are probably coming from the kinds of politics of, of the rich to study degrees, which don't ask you to really think about your worldview very much. And then there might be traditionally more kind of working class institutions which have lent into the arts and humanities. And at the very least, even if they're not left leaning institutions, they ask you to think about the world and your place in it yeah and i think speaking from very specific experience now the subject of, of artificial intelligence one of the one of the difficulties of the last 10 years for that subject is as you said my, my position is that you know this subject has always had ethical things to discuss of course every subject has but 10 years ago you could maybe argue that we were trapped in an ivory tower and students were coming to learn how algorithms worked nowadays it is borderline you know it, it is it is like 50 percent uh, a sociological like phenomenon and and study really and it's still being taught in the same way so you've got these students coming in with the same attitude but suddenly ai is touching every single part of human life and so i think you know, it, yeah, it's becoming increasingly important that that we change how we kind of present stuff to students, especially engineering students, especially STEM people. You know, you and I grew up during the the STEM um, uh, mania, kind of, and and the focus on it and the emphasis of it. And it's important, I think, more important than ever that we try and diffuse some of that. Um, mm. And being for um, folks who don't know, STEM means. Uh... Uh, science technology no science engineering uh, no i think you were right yeah it's science, been a while technology, since I engineering that, and maths yeah, there you go because so, yeah. I, I used to when i was uh just starting out my career i went to a number of um like arts events because i was in this art tech crossover almost immediately and they were like steam putting the a into stem <laughs> putting the arts yes. into yeah anyway sorry yes carry on. <laughs> um no, and of course, so you're right. So for people, again, maybe outside the UK, uh, there was a, I mean, there, there definitely was a focus in, I think, a lot of global north industrialized countries about STEM, but but it, particularly the UK just became obsessed with the idea that if you're going to university, you should go and study a STEM subject because you'll end up getting a job that earns you a lot of money. Um, and that has, <laughs> spoiler alert, that has an impact on, <laughs> on the society that comes out of it. Um, and also like a huge impact on... Um... So very often game degrees, which when I went to university didn't really super exist that much, but increasingly they're becoming popular, but they are being filed so often under STEM. And uh, there's a, a really excellent article by a Brendan, I think, from Australia. This is where we struggle to, well, why I struggle to remember things um, on how we really should be treating um, games education as arts education. I'll... <laughs> I'll, I can't remember if it's Brendan Coe or someone else. Um, it's definitely by an Australian academic, I think, but I'll look it up and put it in the liner notes. But th yeah, the idea that um, in training people, we're not training people to go into, you know, for engineering, for science jobs, very often they're sponsoring degrees. Very often you can have some of your fees paid to go into like large engineering companies. There's a pipeline that takes you through because they want you trained in a certain way and then they will continue to take over your training. For all that you like to train excellent game designers or game developers, there are so many fewer roles out there than there are people excited about getting into game design, which is much truer of, you know, 
arts and, and humanities practices. And therefore, you have to train people in a practice and a means of um, taking care of their practice, even when they're, you know, because your career is in other people's hands and your practice is yours to, to nurture and change and, and to find your way through. And you're more likely to have to set up your own company and, and learn how to market and budget and do proposals and things. So, yeah, um, I think that I yeah, should look up the article and put it into the liner notes. Uh, we've talked about your strike and talked about how it sort of um you know made you feel sort of like actually connected and empowered um how is this one cool thing being on strike for you how is it sort of Im like influencing your practice as a maker of games as someone interested in researching artificial intelligence so i think it it did a couple of things for me um I spent the last 10 years watching the rise of artificial intelligence and watching a lot of really bad things happen as a result. Um, and I've tried to do advocacy where I can and, and use the platform I've been given where I can, but it's hard. And, and when you're up against billion dollar corporations, it's even harder. And I think the last few years I began to feel a little bit defeatist, like actually this is out of hand now, there is no crash coming um, and it might be too hard to stop any of the bad things that are coming. And I think being on strike and standing out there in the cold, handing out pamphlets to people and, and dancing, you know, slowly to uh, to whatever music we had on. Um, I think, you know, going through that fight and the fight got pretty nasty at times. Um, and, you know, a lot of people that I care about very much got, um, you know, went through some pretty horrible experiences with the management and fear of loss of job and, and income and things like that. I ended up leaving Queen Mary, not just because of the strike stuff, but but certainly because of the way they treated um, me. I think going through that process makes made me realize about kind of small, smaller scale action, local action, um, action with people and, and changing the minds of a few people and focusing on one thing. Um, I met up with uh, Dr. Alina Chia, who's a researcher in Goldsmiths um, last year. And I said to her, you know, we we're talking about AI research. And I, I said to her, you know, if you could, would you just press a button and suspend all AI research? Like if, if you could do that. Um, and she said that it's that's not the way to, to think about it. And instead, we should think about trying to find one small place that we can make a difference and, and find a new way of doing things that, that works and uh, how, try and help that idea spread. And I think that really sums up kind of how I felt about being on strike with my friends and colleagues and co-workers and fighting for something and, and hopefully getting a victory. And I think it's changed how I've looked at AI research as a result and games research. So we haven't had a chance to talk about this, but my research, a large focus of my research is about using AI to assist in the game design process. So that could be a AI that can design games on their own, or it could help other people design games. And a lot of the, the discussion about this uh, lately has been about big corporations putting an end to game development as a job. And lots of people are worried. Game artists are worried. Um, musicians are worried. Testers are worried. And I've been thinking about what I can meaningfully do to kind of push back against that. And, and I, my research has adjusted. I've begun to think about how we can build AI systems that not just I, it's not just that I'm avoiding doing something bad, but I'm thinking about how, how I can actively find a way to make our relationship with AI better or healthier um, and focus on small wins, small communities. Um, and so I think it's definitely given me a new perspective there. And um, you mentioned knives and paintbrushes at the beginning. That's a, a little collective with me and some of my students and some of the people I've worked with in the past as well. Working with those people and supervising students has been a similar thing where Maybe it's maybe it's getting older, maybe it's COVID, I don't know what it is, but it's begun to help me appreciate the importance of starting, you know, in your local area and among the people that, that you can reach out to directly and protecting them and supporting them and strengthening them. Because whatever fights are going on around the whole world, you know, the one fight that you're always going to be in is the one that's around you right now. And that's that's the place that you can always have an impact. Um, it was a very long and, and rambling answer to that, to that very uh, concise. <laughs> Isn't that what podcasts are for? Um, <laughs> um, in any case, I, I completely, I think that really chimes with me in, in that the COVID has pushed me. And it's taken me a while to get there because for a long time, and I like to feel like I can resist like 
the prevailing discourse around events and, and sort of step outside and, and look at them. But I wasn't immune to that feeling that life had been put on pause and that we've just been waiting to press play again. And I, I know a lot, of, I feel like a lot of people have pressed play and I haven't yet, but I've still allowed myself to get stuck in this idea that there's a pause and a play button on COVID and that I can go back to how it was before. And I I lived a very, um, a very distributed life, a very wide life. I was, you know, traveling lots. I was collaborating with people around the world. I was part in a small way of that kind of traveling cabal of um, like game devs who meet at three conferences a year and they're all in different countries. And, and notwithstanding the, the the climate crisis impact of um, that being a part of, of my job, um, I, I think that something that, um, so the Deacon Fabric have a, um, a mental health plugin called Spill. I'm not are trying to advertise them but what's really great about it is that um it's like counseling for people whenever you like you just sort of book it and it's remote and it can work for everyone around the world in our company and just before i took a sort of extra extended sort of christmas break i, I thought i'm gonna book some time with a counselor and try and avoid the idea that i need to like win my time off you know like optimize it and 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 do the best resting i possibly could but just talk through with someone like how to like really listen to my needs because i was taking a full month off one of the things this counselor said to me was i think kind of you, you kind of need to just spend a tiny bit of time grieving like grieving who you were because that allow you to sort of like step outside of that pause and, and play kind of idea and and find out who you want to build next. And my answer has very much been, I was very wide. I was very sort of, um, you know, <laughs> distributed. And my communities are all over the world. And I am i don't want to lose those communities. I'm still in contact with them. Technology helps us do that. But actually, I think I need to work out how to build a deep life, like reconnect to local cycling communities and local political communities and as much as i dislike keir starmer and everything he's doing with the labor party you always find that the local labor party is pretty radical compared to the leadership in my experience so you know connect to them or connect to the local greens or the local active travel movement that kind of thing so i just i think there's something that's really chiming there in what you say about taking stock of who's around you right now and and maybe shouting at the world about the change that's required is is a thing that we need to go through and a thing that everyone needs to do but in the end making change and connections locally can can be just as effective um i, I like what you said about resting there as well and it mm -hmm. reminds me of something that i got told on the picket line funnily enough i was apologizing for the fact that i hadn't managed to turn up to enough of the days on the picket line and someone told me well part of being on strike is about resting and about looking after yourself and getting ready for the next strike or the next going back to work and all these things. And the immense amount of care from, from all of these people and encouraging me to think about myself um, so that I could go on and do this work in the future was, was also really important. And I, I, to take, I to, to take it back to my students again, I mean, that's been another really difficult thing of, wanting to, as you say, advocate for change and do things and all of this stuff, and also not not kind of hurting yourself in the process. And I'm very fortunate to be surrounded by people who kind of look out for that. Um, and they actually see that in me and warn me about it, which is great. But as you say, it's it's really hard to avoid that trap of, of uh, <laughs> optimizing every aspect of, of what you're doing, including rest. And you can burn yourself out worrying about all the things that there are to do. And that's not to say that these big fights are not important. I know that you're very passionate about the big fights as much as the small ones, um, and I am too. Um, but I think there's something, I, I think this, the, the local stuff gives you the energy to keep caring about the big stuff, doesn't it? Because it has that personal that personal attachment. Absolutely. And, and learning to think um, in terms of collective is, is just really tough as well. Like, I, I think part of acknowledging things like white supremacy and patriarchy and like cis patriarchy is acknowledging your personal role in it so that you can at least try and unpick it as, as part of, you know, politics of the personal, but also <laughs> you, you, you can't get bogged down in, in the guilt because that's kind of a, a selfishness, right? 
that that stops you from from being able to participate collectively in, in pushing for change i think that connecting to to unions connecting in that way to community collectives in general learning to think like that is a i, I mean i think you're my generation right would you call yourself an elder millennial <laughs> yes yes love that love that don't know how to tiktok that's basically my identity um so yeah, in the context of that, I, I don't, I think that's a tough thing. All of, all of our stories are about heroes and I, I feel like learning how to think collectivistly, that's not a word, but it'll do. Um, like for example, I was very politically active in the, the, you know, 2007 to like 2015. I was going on a lot of climate protests. I was going on a lot of student protests I you know, was holding hands around coal-fired power stations and getting kettled by cops. And I, I just, I, I began to get incredibly burned out. Um, and I, I haven't got back to it yet. And, and a lot of that is to just do with where I am in my career as well and how much energy it takes to try and build a, a, a company which also does, uh, treads a path of least harm. Equally, my mother is now an incredibly active member of Extinction Rebellion. And I know that there are some issues with Extinction Rebellion. My, I'm out here saying my mum's one of the good ones. I don't know, probably a bit biased there. Um, she used to be incredibly politically active when, you know, she was, <laughs> she closed the, the um, what's the tunnel that goes under the Thames? Um, uh, black, 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 black wall. Not sure. Anyway, it's now it's a bridge and a tunnel. So it was a very large like connection from the south uh, of the Thames to the north of the Thames. And in the era of Thatcher, she was on strike and she closed this tunnel down when Thatcher was visiting the local. Um, this is like funny thing with with my mum who who's from Lincolnshire, which is where Thatcher is from. They're basically the same age. Uh, basically the same. Yeah, I don't know. There's there's a lot of funny things there but yeah she was very politically active she was closing down tunnels she was like strongly active within her union then she had kids and you know she um just sort of had a lot on for a number of years but she's returned now she's retired to being incredibly politically active whether or not she's doing backroom work helping people who've been arrested or coordinating things or she's out there getting arrested herself, which does worry me, obviously. Like I'm <laughs> I find myself getting a call saying, just just so you know, your mum's been arrested. And I'm like, oh, all right, great, fine. I'm just gonna sit here and worry for a while then. Um in that context, there's a generational thing as well. Like, as much as our generation is taught to divide ourselves from boomers, my mum is a boomer out there, like now putting herself in the way of climate crisis. And that has been really, really, as much as I don't want my mum to get hit by a cop, I am also super, super grateful for this sense of like, I don't have the energy right now, perhaps to, you know, go and and, and stand in the way of, of climate crisis today. But my mum's there doing it. And when she was taking a break, I was out there doing it. And just that generational thing has, has really helped me. And just as you say, it sounds like the the collective um, like kind of presence of a union, that reminder from someone that this is this is not on you, it's us and we take care of one another. And that's how this works. Yeah. Um, I, I think is really powerful. I think it's easy when, when you care about something, it's easy to beat yourself up for not doing enough. Um, and there is a difference between complacency and not being able to do things. Um, but, you know, there are people who might not be able to attend the picket line, for example, because they're immunocompromised or, or things like that. So we can't all demonstrate our, our stuff in kind of the same way. But that doesn't mean that there aren't things that, that we can do. So, for example, what you were saying is absolutely right. Like your work at Degouta Fabric, I think, is a great example of trying to do something that will have very long lasting impacts, potentially, you know, it's a it's an example to other people, you're trying out something completely new. Um, your mum having kids was clearly a revolutionary act, because she's ended up raising you who who ended up going and doing lots of other political things. You know, there's so many ways in which in which we can have an impact. Um, and I, I think that it both it both gave me the confidence to like i think that that was the other thing about about going onto that picket line was i felt like oh i can actually do this it gave me it gave me confidence and when you're in ai spaces um that those those can often be kind of scary spaces also where you need confidence to to do things but also it doesn't all have to be the same kind of doing things there's many different ways in which we can have impact um and yeah i think 
it's it's great to energize ourselves but then when that energy dips or when we need to go and do something else we also need to appreciate like the many different ways in which um we can have an impact that uh and, and not not be as harsh on ourselves i guess of course and and actually some of the just to bring this back to ai some of the most exciting examples i see of ai within games to me are about like okay your energy dipped how can this lift you up so um my uh my friends at model ai um are like one of the things i know that they have worked on with a company included in really i'm saying really really general terms because i i don't remember what i've been nda like a friend dna into um but for example something they could do i'm not saying they have done this is um say you're a level designer they could take like with like the levels you've designed before they could just have their systems generate example levels and then your job can be instead of creating it can be editing it can be taking inspiration from those things equally um Leica, as in the uh the space dog Leica, um by uh Shah Putney and uh Martin Pickle Picklemare um are very very much focused on um tools for supporting writers so they they can take all of your writing if you give them your writing as a data set they can sort of take it back and and write with you as an ai or you can say today okay i want to plug in the works of jane austen and you know collaborate with jane austen just to sort of get my creative yeah juices flowing so i i see the most exciting kind of um creative applications of ai as kind of solidarities <laughs> as a as a lifting up when you do dip um i i don't know if that's like something that you see also no, I, I think um, I, I like I really like that as well. I mean, my own work building a system called Puck has been to try and build a piece of software that can participate in creative communities. So I think you and I have both witnessed kind of the the work that it takes to maintain a community of any kind. Um, and I think if AI can kind of assist with that and provide support and focal points and uh, you know a sense of community I think that's like a really exciting thing for creative groups all around the world um, and I think I think both of those examples you've given I like it because they're different they're different kinds of AI right they're different ways in which our future could be and something that I've been really talking about a lot lately is people can't demand futures that they can't imagine. So it's actually quite powerful to be able to show them other things that AI can do, because largely we're only being shown AI futures by you know one or two companies. And the more futures that we get shown, the more we have to choose from and the more that we can demand from people. And that's also, I feel like the function of a union, or at least it was for me, is that once people from the union are saying, actually, why don't we like put an end to casualization? Or why don't we just demand like better workloads or, or a 35 hour week? Um, and then you just think, oh yeah, we we could actually like, like we could actually demand like an inflation based uh, pay rise and things like that. Like you need people to put these suggestions forwards before you even know that they're there to ask for them. And with AI, that's even more important because AI is a very complicated technology and it's not well explained to people. So I, I really love stuff like that because I think it begins to jog people's memories a little bit and, and um, spark imagination in the same way that good science fiction does. It gets us thinking about what the future could be like. Um, of course, and I, um, I just think that's so powerful right now. Yeah, and yeah. of course we should acknowledge that, like, um, that's that's the hopeful um, kind of perspective on AI. And part of the problem are, for example, um, AI voice actors who are using um, voice act like uh, live voice actor uh, recordings without permission, or you know, um, artists having their work scraped into the source material for AI art and not least all of the uh, biases, the, you know, the racism, the, the cis patriarchy and, and how that gets amalgamated into databases from which this stuff can, can draw. That's just a, a small example of, um, you know, the, the, the low hanging fruit in terms of how AI can, can be used really, really problematically. I mean, obviously, unions could challenge this stuff they could like unionization could be a route to like for example voice actor unions or artist unions actually holding these businesses accountable um I, I wonder if you have reflections on um some of those problems and and how you, you feel like you know 
is it just offering an alternative vision or are there more things sort of going on within the community it's um it's very difficult because i i've seen a lot of this stuff coming for a long time try to you know you try to talk to people you try to be critical you try to give you know perspectives to the press for example but there's a lot of money involved and it's really hard to stop these things from happening and we are now seeing them happen my view is that the people that need to make decisions about these things are the people affected by them, um, like voice actors, for example. I think unionizing against these things is a great example. Um, and we can look at like the the origin of the word Luddite or, you know, the the activism that people did in the past, specifically regarding automation or, or um, mechanization of their work. Um, and I think it's really important that 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 voice of the people affected is there one of the dangers of this technology you know the the adage move fast and break things is now kind of infamous um in a, describing the way the technology industry works and something that i've come to realize recently is that one of the advantages for people for, for ai companies um, of that phrase is that once something's broken um there isn't really a way to fix it and so the ai company is kind of left to do whatever they want. Once these databases exist, they can't really easily be unexisted. Um, they can't be put out of existence again. Um, uh, the cat is kind of out of the bag. Um, and so I think it's it's important to act as fast as we can. Um, but I think we also need to accept that damage is going to be done in the same way that we accept that this Tory government is going to do damage right now. Um, and then the question then becomes, how can we work together in solidarity with one another to kind of protect people from this damage and support us and find a way forwards? Um, I think that's been a big change for me in the last few years is realizing that it might not be possible to stop OpenAI from completely destabilizing academic publishing or, or completely destabilizing the way that teachers uh, grade essays. Um, and instead, we're going to have to look at how can we stand by one another and support the people who are worst affected by this um, and kind of forge a future for ourselves. Um, we're going to have to do it ourselves because it might be that that no one else is going to come and, and help us do it. But that's OK, um, because I've seen what happens now um, if we stand by each other. Um, and I, I know that, that, that good things can come out of it. If anyone's listening to this and they felt like maybe I did, uh, you know, before I joined the union where I didn't really know what it was involved or was a little bit scared of it or something like that. Um, joining the union has been one of the most positive things that's happened to me in the last five years. Uh, everyone I've met has been lovely. I've learned loads of things. It was a very low pressure. I feel more protected when when sketchy things happen to me at work. Um and it's just, it's not a scary thing at all. Um, so I highly recommend people to look into it. And if you're a PhD student listening to this in the UK, I think you can join for free, at least for a year. Um, so definitely look into it. I think that would be the only thing I'd I'd love to offer here. Yeah, there's power in a union. Billy Bragg still going around my head. <laughs> um, great. So I'm just going to wrap up by asking if you've got anything that you'd like to promote or any socials that people should follow you on. Oh, you can come and see me. I'm MTRC on uh, places like Twitter or Mastodon or Cohost. Cohost, I've been having good fun on there. Um, and uh, you can also find like things I've written and games I've made at my website, uh, possibilityspace.org. Possibilityspace.org. Thank you. Great. So, well, thank you so much for your time today, Mike. I hope everyone's enjoyed us uh, getting a little bit political today. Um, <laughs> I, I think I probably spoke more on this this particular recording than I have some of the others. Um, so I also hope that's okay with our listeners. But otherwise, I just want to say a really big thank you for being so generous with your time today and uh, bringing in your one cool thing, being on strike. Thank you so much, Anna. It was a pleasure. I have to say the temptation to burst into song is still with me, um, but we're going to put a link to Billy Bragg's Power in a Union in the liner notes, as I promised, uh, just so that you can sing along in your own comfort and I don't have to make anyone hear me sing. Um, thanks so much for listening to this episode of One Cool Thing from Digo de Fabrique. Uh, as usual, leave a rating or review where you can. If this time was of value to you, that's the best way that you can say thank you. Please do share news about the podcast on social media if you want to. Um, I'll be back soon with a new episode speaking with another cool thinker and maker in the field of video games. And in the meantime, follow Digo de Fabrique on places such as Instagram, Twitter and YouTube. You can find us in most places as Guta Fabrique, that's G-U-T-E-F-A-B-R-I-K. Stay thoughtful, friends. Take care. Goodbye.